Texas for the national championship for Nebraska. When somebody says, would you play football? Yeah, I played at Nebraska. They ask you, did you play in that 84 Orange Bowl game? 48 seconds to play, Nebraska one point behind. Well, it's all up to this play as far as Nebraska's concerned. And now we find out, do you go for one or do you try a two-point conversion? The integrity of Nebraska football and that whole stakes out of line. All the success that we had that season, all the records we broke, that one play is what's remembered. I like to remember the whole season. Oscar's up 28 0. 63 to 7. 66 to 20 is the score. 72 to 29. Let's see parts for him, and it's a touchdown. Another one of those classic mismatches. Our vision and our goal that we had at the beginning of the year, it was 13 0. Nobody laid a hand on 84 13. They wanted to, they could score 120 points. Here's a new NCAA record. The sports information director at that particular time made a poster that's going into that season. I think it was called the Scoring Explosion. The wide receiver on that team was Irving Fryer. Jared given to Fryer on the reverse. First pick in the first round, Irving Fryer, wide receiver in Nebraska. The running back on that team. Pitch to Rozier, touchdown. Mike Rozier won the Heisman Trophy. The quarterback on that team, Turner Gill. Turner Gill. One of the great option quarterbacks in college football history. Holy cow, Turner Gill. And sitting at the top of the pyramid of this offensive juggernaut that just rolled over people was this guy named Tom Osborne. His thought process in calm plays is so far ahead of everybody else, it's unbelievable. An offensive genius. I got to say, that sneaky touchdown kind of looked like some more of the wizardry of Oz, didn't it? A little bit. Maybe the greatest coach of all time. This man was playing chess against opponents who were playing checkers. This man was programmed from day one, birth, Hastings, Nebraska. You play this game to win. I think in Nebraska, people like to think that Tom Osborne represents their values. I grew up in uh, Hastings, Nebraska, certainly middle America, rural agriculture, livestock around. Good place to grow up. My whole life as a young person was really athletics, football, basketball, track, and baseball in the summer. Tom enjoyed the competition and tried to compete honorably and in the right way. He's hardworking, he's blue collar. That's how Nebraskans see themselves. Whatever decisions I've made have been influenced in large part by how I grew up, where I came from, parents I had, the value system that you develop. We lost to the Gators to start the year. And I remember Howard telling him after the game, we're going to go on and win the next 11 games. I knew at the end of that game that we were going to be a great team. And I'm scratching my head going, did he just watch what I watched? We just got beat 20 to 3. Most people scoffed. Of course, they never lost again. You see before you the man who has just led the University of Miami to the Orange Bowl. Ready to take on one of the great teams in college football history, the Nebraska Cornhuskers. You say college football at that time, the 70s and early 80s, and you're envisioning the end of Nebraska. Year after year after year, Nebraska won more games than any team, and it all began with Bob Devaney. Bob Devaney had won back-to-back -back titles, and Tom was playing against that expectation. They won the Big Eight every year. All-American after All-American. They were the best team in 30 years that ever played college football. University of Miami, we were floundering. Miami was jack. After I was hired, they were going to leave big-time football. Then Howard came in and basically got the thing rolling. It was Howard Schellenberger's dream that something big would happen there. It was a melting pot of people that season. Howard was able to bring that team together 
coming into the game, we were the third-ranked defense in the nation. We had great skilled people on offense. But uh, realistically, uh, there was a very little chance that we could win. And the assumption was that Nebraska was just going to roll right through Miami and win that national championship. The night before the game, I remember talking to my roommate, saying, tomorrow this time, we're going to be national champions. You're playing, like, really David against Goliath. South Florida is just right for this most important college football game. Kind of a miracle scenario happened during the day. With things happening in the Cotton Bowl, the Sugar Bowl, and some of the other bowls where people were starting to lose. The dominoes fell absolutely perfectly. And now it's five against one. The whole entire nation now knew this was for the national championship. The Miami Hurricanes, the underdog by two touchdowns. But keep in mind, it's a home game for Miami. Probably, what, six out of seven people were wearing Miami orange or green. We took the opening kickoff, boom. The first play of the game was past six Texas Z square. First play of the evening is a big one. Before the game, I told my offensive coordinator and my quarterback, we're going to throw the ball on every first down until we throw an incomplete pass. And we did. We're down the field. We're up 17 to nothing. You're looking at the scoreboard. You're trying to figure out what's going on. That's when the triage units were mobilized all over Nebraska to stop the bleeding. A long way to go, but the biggest upset of the year could be brewing in the Orange Bowl. There was no screaming, no yelling. There was just thinking about what do we got to do to get back into the game. For Nebraska, shockingly, they had to resort to trickery to, to get on the board. Fumble Ruski. Fumble Ruski. Fumble Ruski. Can you believe a grand masculine football team like Nebraska would stoop to a fumble Ruski? It's an intentional fumble and the guard just scoops it up and runs around in. I was already dead tired. I go, this ain't going to work very good. Had somebody kick the ball or something go wrong, and it looks like the dumbest play in the world. Third and a long five. Heading to the end zone and very close to it. Dean Steinkohler, he's in for a touchdown. This is a chess match, and we have the grandmaster up there making the moves. We're on the board. That's immoral, unsportsmanlike, almost illegal play. Hey, it's a play, and uh, it's about execution. It just seemed like there was a lot of pressure on us offensively to keep climbing back into it. Late in the third quarter, Miami 31 to 17. In the drama builds. Rozier, he's got blockers. Puts a move on, comes back. And Sutton makes a move on him and knocks him down. He cut me, and my ankle just turned inside. Mike Rozier, the Heisman Trophy winner, not back in the game after he was tackled and injured his left ankle. Wanting to know how long it was going to be before he get back out on the field, you know? I, I mean, I want Mike Rozier on the field. Trying to walk it up. Oh, man, you, you lose your best player. Jeff Smith comes in, and they don't miss a beat. Well, I was just excited to be out there and play. Jeff Smith has taken over for Rozier. Over the top, Jeff Smith. The Huskers are right back in it. 31-24, Miami with the lead. That's the most important time to, you know, use your acting ability and pretend you're not flustered. I had to get us in a position to get, to get a field goal. In the flat, it goes to Eddie Brown, and he dives ahead. Try a 43-yard field goal. Miami might very well be the national champions. You're thinking this could be it right here. Miami's going to win this game. It's over. And it's no good. And so the Corn Huskers get back the ball with 1.47 to go. And the unbeaten Nebraska team trailing by seven. That last drive has to be one of the most interesting drives in football. I mean, it was, it was just amazing. Really, that was a that was a gut check drive. We had to have it. Second down and eight, 112 to play. At that point, it seems in inevitable that Nebraska's gonna score and that it, we're gonna have this decision on what to do. He was wide open at the goal line. <laughs> and uh, Irving didn't drop very many, but he dropped that one. And uh, I, I certainly remember that. 
to go from, you know, Friars drop pass to uh, we had a fumble that Dino picked up. We had fourth down and eight. Cornhuskers have fourth down and eight. The ball at the 24-yard line of Miami. The game's over if, if they don't get it. You didn't know what they were going to do. They, you'd think they're going to throw it on fourth and eight. Of course, that set up the decision point as to whether to kick the point or to, to go for the win. It's a zero-sum game at that point. This whole national championship, the whole season, boils down to this one moment. There is no overtime, as you know, in college football. They have the option of going for the win with a two-point conversion. The much higher percentage kicked extra point would mean a tie game. Nebraska was the only undefeated team at the end of the season. Most people said, if you kick the extra point, you're national champion. And I think Tom probably knew that. Nebraska is not a play for the tie state. This is a state that was settled by people who chopped sod out of the prairie and made homes out of that, and who lived inside of those sod homes when it was 20 below with two feet of snow and the nearest town 30 miles away. To kick, I think, would have put this game in a category that it did not want to be in. It's not in the historical cultural bedrock of Nebraska to go for a tie. If you don't want to tie against a Cinderella team, how would that look? Can you imagine Crazy Horse, the great Lakota war chief, a Nebraskan, sending a runner splashing across the little bighorn, charging up Custer Hill, and saying, General, we both lost a lot of good men this afternoon. Why don't we just do a rock, scissors, paper, and call it a day? It was no doubt we wanted to be 13 and 0. Tom Osborne, same DNA. Very polite, very humble. But you drill a quarter of an inch between that Gary Cooper-esque persona, and you will find the heart of an insanely competitive beast. Nothing in his makeup from day one to January of 1984 says, let's go for the tie. If you're going to win a championship, you need to be a clear-cut winner. I have not seen the kicker come on the field, and I don't think he's coming on the field. There's almost no time to think about this. No one took a timeout. They've got things going their way. We're going to prove that we're the greatest football team ever. We're, we're going to finish this thing right. He's on the sideline, and I'm looking over at him, and he's just standing there. To me, uh, it was pretty much automatic. It wasn't something that I stood there and worried about or debated about it. I knew he had pre-thought this situation because he didn't take but a few seconds to send them out there. Look back at the sideline there and, and see what he's doing, whether he got one <laughs> finger or whether he has two fingers up. You're on the headphones with people up in the booth. I thought is what we do, go for the two points. He just holds up two fingers. He's decided to go for two and take a shot and win. I commend him for it. Hey, hey, come on, everybody. Let's go, let's go. Get back on the huddle and let it go. Tom Alvadotti, our defensive coordinator, he didn't even bat an eyelash. He goes, I know what they're going to do. I said, Tom, what's, what do you got called? And he says, double dog trio. I said, great, that's the best call we could be in. I'm in the huddle looking at Turner Gill on that final play. Everybody's eyes were up and, and ready to go and anticipating and, and thinking nothing but the positive. Hey, there have been a lot of great plays. I guess the last one's always the most important. I think he had so much confidence in his football team that they could score from three yards out. He believed it. His players believed it. I think the expressions on our faces, we turned from the huddle and went to the line. I don't think anybody had any doubt we were going to convert. We felt we had a good two-point play. It was a play that we had worked on. We hadn't shown it before. 51-2 flat uh, was our call. You'd think they're going to run the option. I believed very strongly in Turner Gill and his ability to throw the ball. Who would have expected us, this pounding running team, to throw the ball on a, on a two-point conversion at the end of the game? They came to the line of scrimmage. The ball was snapped. The linebackers are blitzing, putting pressure on the quarterback. Irving Fry was kind of the decoy. We had him in the slot. We would take our two wide receivers and uh, run slant patterns with both of them. So we were hoping that the defense would end up seeing Irving. And then we had Jeff Smith in the backfield and going out into the flat. I saw Kenny take a step inside and went, oh, God. It looks like Jeff Smith is open over there. I never did see Jeff coming out of the backfield. 
Then you saw what was happening, and he came off the man-to-man -man coverage. I looked to uh, Turner Gill, and I saw him look into the flat. There goes the ball. I sprinted towards the path of the ball. Unfortunately, I didn't throw the ball correctly. Deflected the ball with my right hand. Got these two fingers. So it was a solid hit, so I, I knew I made enough contact. The ball went off my shoulder pad. And all of a sudden, the ball is fluttering away. If the pass would have been a little bit further out, he may not have got there. That's the difference. Instead of him trying to have to do this to catch it versus him having to do that to catch it, that's the difference. Game of inches. You hear nothing until the play is over, and then you hear the crowd roar. Cost us the national championship. That was the end of it. Horrible. It was horrible. Hurt. Pain. Tough. Went on the sideline, balling. Balling. <laughs> it's like a little kid. You can't compare it to the death of a friend or somebody like that, but when you have that much invested in one game, it, it was it was crushing. For about a split second, or maybe a second, Osborne looked a little discouraged, kind of, you know, almost put his head down. I tend to internalize things and wasn't that I didn't feel disappointed, you know, but uh, I'm sorry we just didn't get it done. I can remember just being in the shower, getting ready for school, just bawling. You know, just that big of a letdown. I can just imagine the disappointment in the state of Nebraska. I remember coming home afterward and the fans actually greeted us in the airport. We got sort of a hero's welcome, even though we lost the game. And I remember just sort of having my head down, thinking, gee, we don't deserve this. And tonight was the uh, fulfillment of a dream that, uh, I say fulfillment, it might just be the beginning of a dream. Because of that game, I think it helped put a university from a football standpoint on the map. Miami doesn't win, then is the U the U? Maybe we don't get the Michael Irvins to come, uh, the type of players that came to the University of Miami that won those national championships. If Miami doesn't win, Howard Schnellenberger probably doesn't take the job in the USFL, which means that Jimmy Johnson probably doesn't come to Miami. It really was a watershed moment. Game that'll be replayed emotionally by these players and their fans throughout the years. Can I lie to you and tell you I haven't thought about it during the last 30 years? Yeah, I have. I'm still sick to my stomach over the game. I don't want to remember that. It's, it's a part of me. It's a, it's a part of all the players who, who played. To lose that hurts, it took a while. I don't know how many years, but it took a while. You know, 10 years from now, this will probably be the only thing that sticks out in my mind. That's going to be the shame of it all. I, re I relate. I never saw anybody even second guess it. And you know what? It's, I'm sure it'd be a great story if there was dissension on the team on whether we got it for two or not. I wouldn't have any shame. 30, 40 years later, and nobody's saying, hmm, he tied, but he won the title. It's just his name, the team. He got the rings. Felt bad about not winning a championship for those guys, because uh, those seniors, uh, they were going to get another chance. Pretty proud to be a part of that. But if I had a choice of having a national championship ring, and being remembered as a part of the team that went for two, I take the national championship ring. I think he was thinking more about his players, and he was thinking about how we would live with his decision. One thing I really enjoyed about athletics was I felt there were so many teachable moments, things that people take away from that experience that stays with them the rest of their lives. That one game really turned me into doing certain things a certain way and why I coach the way I coach. Be who you are and don't let the outside distractions deter you on really what you believe is right to do.
I think if I had ended my coaching career and we'd never won a national championship, I'm sure there would be maybe some people who would still say, well, that was really a, a mistake. You really blew it because you could have won a national championship and you didn't. For 22 years, he labored and waited, and now the moment is his. I think everybody got a little national title out of that win. It was certainly a great feeling of relief, but I didn't have an overwhelming feeling of, well, some type of vindication or anything like that. Sure, it was vindication. We're playing Miami in the Orange Bowl, uh, and we weren't stopped this time. I was hoping that people would forget about what happened and that they would move on with their lives with that game. There's symmetry to the, the 95 uh, Orange Bowl, certainly, because it was Miami. But with Tom, it was the process, doing things the right way. And, and if you do them, things will work out for you. The importance to me was always more about how you played uh, the game rather than the, the trophy. 90% of the coaches would have kicked the extra point and tied it. It brings out even more character about who Tom Osborne is. Wow. Man, that, that guy made that decision? Unsportsmanlike conduct with John Bishop and former Husker national champion, Matt Verso. The 1984 Orange Bowl, it's one of the most famous decisions in the history of college football. So here's John in Omaha. I'll never forget my friend that made a statement that that was the dumbest decision in Nebraska football history and my dad's face went ghostly white. And he said, you can go now. 